Well, it is my privilege to introduce to you our next preacher. Uh, we are so thrilled and delighted to have Dr. Robert Smith Jr. with us. He's not a stranger to New Orleans Seminary. He's been here on multiple occasions. He spoke at no restraints, I think Dr. Farmer said three years ago, and before that meeting was over, Jeff and I said we've got to ask him to come back. This, this man is in great demand. He would not tell you this, but uh, he, he is a much sought after preacher. Uh, I don't do a lot of traveling out of state, but I was, I was in Missouri about two months ago. I was asked to speak to the Missouri State Evangelism Conference. And when I was checking into the hotel there in the lobby was Dr. Smith. And that was special for me, but for him it was just another opportunity to travel all over this world. And so it, it is it's a joy for us to have him here tonight. For 21 years he has been teaching preaching at the Beeson School of Divinity. He occupies the Charles T. Carter Chair of Preaching. Now that may not mean a lot to you, but in Alabama, the Charles T. Carter Chair, that's like Elvis in Graceland in Alabama. And uh, he occupies that chair, he's preached, he's taught there for 21 years while pastoring full-time a church in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so for the last 20 years, he has he is, uh, been a shepherd of a flock. He's fed his flock every week, travels back and forth, and in between time, travels to New Orleans and Missouri and because he's just surrendered to God's will to, uh, to be a servant. Uh, he's impacted my life, I just want you to know. Uh, when we hugged tonight, uh, and I hadn't been with him in a while. When I hugged him, I was reminded of the last time I hugged him because I said, Dr. Smith, what sort of aftershave are you wearing? He said, well, it's the, my wife buys this for me. I said, well, I want to know what it is. He said, it's Joe Van Musk. I went out and bought it that next day. And uh, you might want to remember that. If you want to preach like Robert Smith Jr., <laughs> get you some Joe Van Musk aftershave. I dearly love this brother. Dr. Smith, would you come and let me pray for you? Let's pray for Dr. Smith as he comes. Father, thank you for this precious brother in Christ. He's your servant. He's here tonight to preach your precious word. And so I pray you'll use him to preach truth into our lives this night for our good, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, brother. I love you, brother. <laughs> it's Joe Van it. Musk. It is. I can smell it. Thank you, my dear brother, Dr. Mark Tolbert. I appreciate you very much. God has created a bond between us. I've known that for some time. And uh, my wife and I look forward to the fellowship that we're gonna have post-worship experience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeff Farmer, for your hospitality, your graciousness. To uh, President Chuck Kelly, what a message, what a message. A message that spoke to my head and my heart and a message that moves my hands to do what this message talked about. I am a greater understanding of what it means to be a recipient of grace and to stand up on the floor whenever he wakes me up and realize that the granite of grace is holding me up. You preached out of your heart I've always appreciated you. You are a giant, and yet you walk with common people. And thank you for allowing me to stand behind this place where I know the gospel is faithfully preached each time. Thank you so much. Uh, my brothers, thank you so much for having me again, and I look forward to the fellowship with you, getting to know you more. Um, I accepted this invitation, and since because I realized I would be meeting some of you for the first time and uh, it's about time for us to get to know each other because we're going to spend eternity together. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to, um, to be a part of this fellowship. The 23rd Psalm, the 23rd Psalm. I want to talk about the neglected God. The neglected God. The sweet psalmist David picks up his pen of inspiration and dips it in the ink of illumination and writes the 23rd Psalm. 
I want to convey tonight that the loyal, covenant, loving, shepherding ministry of Christ empowers believers to trust the Father through the Holy Spirit to the end of his or her days. The loyal, covenantal, loving, loving, shepherding ministry of Christ, empowered by the Spirit, propels believers to trust the Father to the end of their days. I'm Trinitarian. Let me say it one more time. I want to convey tonight that the loyal, covenantal, loving, shepherding ministry of Christ, empowered by the Spirit, propels believers to trust the Father to the end of their days. The triune God is fully present in the 23rd Psalm. We see him. He feeds us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads us. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He is with us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He is before us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with all my cup runs over. He is beyond us. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The triune God is fully present in the 23rd Psalm. He's there as the Father. In fact, the very first verse opens up with Yahweh. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. The last verse, verse 6, closes with Yahweh. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh, the Lord, forever. So the book ends for the 23rd Psalm is Yahweh, verse 1, and Yahweh, verse 6. He is Alpha and Omega. He is beginning and the end. He is first and the last. He is the prologue and the epilogue. And everything else in between, he is in charge of. And therefore, the Father is present in this psalm. The Son, God the Son in Jesus Christ is present in this psalm. In fact, it is an anticipatory psalm when it comes to the modeling ministry of Christ. He shows us how to be shepherds through the ministry of his son Jesus Christ. Look at what Zechariah says about him in Zechariah chapter 13 Verse number 17, and it is fulfilled in the ministry of Christ. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. It anticipates Christ. Listen to Christ himself. Say in John 10 and 11, I am the good shepherd. Mm. And listen to what the author of Hebrews says about him in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 20. He is called the Great shepherd. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, he is called the chief shepherd. God, the Son, Christ, is present in this psalm. But when it comes to God, the Holy Spirit, the visibility is greatly diminished and the volume is greatly decreased. It's as if God as spirit is neglected. I know Francis Chan says he's forgotten. I want to move that into another ram. He is neglected. When you read what Philip Melanchthon, who was a disciple of Martin Luther, 
an associate of Martin Luther says in his 1521, Losi Communis, commonplaces. He says, to fully know Christ is to know his benefits, his workings, and his appropriating. I think the same thing can be said about the Spirit. To fully know the Spirit is to know his benefits, his workings, and his appropriating. In other words, to know his attributes. And when we know his attributes and what he does, we see that the Spirit is fully present and fully vocalized in this psalm. Look at him. The Bible says that he leads me in the paths of righteousness. He leads me beside still waters. The ministry of the Spirit is one of leading. Hear what Jesus says in the 16th chapter of John, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth has come, he will lead us into all truth. The word is hagit geo, hagit geo, which means to lead, to instruct. In fact, it's the same word that's found in that eighth chapter of Acts where, P, where uh, Philip is walking alongside of a chariot that is being chauffeured by this Ethiopian eunuch who lived in Ethiopia, came to the Pentecostal revival, couldn't stay there because here is a man who has been castrated or his genitals have been crushed. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 1, any person who has genitalia that's cut off or castrated cannot enter into the assembly of God. He heard it, but he could not go into the actual physical place. He heard Peter say in Acts 2.39, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all of those who are far off, to as many as the Lord our God shall call. And he's reading Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. He's reading it in the Old Testament Greek, the Septuagint. As a lamb is led before the slaughter and a sheep before shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, he is denied justice. And what shall we say concerning his descendants? For he has been cut off. And Philip asked him in verse 30, do you understand what you're reading? And in verse 31, he responds, how can I accept someone how to gail me? That is the same word in John 16, 13. How can I understand that someone lead me? And the ministry of the Spirit is to lead. And we see that it is the Spirit that brings both of them out of the baptismal waters and leads this man back to Ethiopia where he is given credit by the church fathers for planning the first church, the Coptic church, in the first century of the patristic period. The Spirit leads us. Not only does he lead us, but the Spirit restores us. He restores my so, and David will pray in Psalm 51, take not thy Holy Spirit, verse 11 and 12, from me. Cast me not away from your presence and restore unto me the joy of my salvation. The joy, the joy. David is not asking God to restore his joy. That remains. That is, restore his salvation, but his joy. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, Galatians 5.22, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, timbers, and faith. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. And here David sees himself in need of restoration. He leads me in the paths of righteousness mm, for his name's sake. The shepherd does this so that the name of the owner can be lifted up so that the owner can have a reputation that is great, exalted, and magnified. And what is the ministry of the Spirit for? Ultimately, I believe it is according to what Jesus says in John 16 and 14. Uh, when he comes, the Spirit of truth comes, he will not speak of himself. He will speak of me because he has come to testify of me, to glorify me. He is my public relations manager. He is to exalt me. And any time we talk about expository preaching and Christ is not exalted, I don't care what you say, it ain't expository preaching. 
Christ must be exalted. Christ must be glorified. And if that is the number one position of the Spirit, then what excuse did I have when I stand to preach before people and Jesus is not exalted and multi and magnified? And verse number four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. The ministry of the Spirit is to be with us. Listen to what Jesus says in John 14 and 17. He says, when I give you another comfort in verse 16, he will be with you because he will be in you. I can only be with you geographically one place at one time, but he is going to be in you, which in essence means that God as Father is God without skin. He's spirit. That's what he meant when he told uh, this woman at the well, God is spirit. The alpha is not there in the Greek in John 4, 24. God is spirit, not a spirit, but God is spirit. Therefore, the father is God without skin. The son is God with skin. John 1, 14, the word Christ was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. He takes on skin. He is the human face of God. He is the parable of God. But the Holy Spirit is God who gets inside of our skin because he comes to live with us. That's why we can sing, he walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me that I'm his own. The joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known, not three gods, but God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. He is in us. I will be with you. I fear no evil because thou art with thee. Your rod and staff comforts me. Is that not a synonym for the name of the Spirit? Parakletos, one who is called alongside of us to comfort us or to help us. He is our comforter. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16 and verse number, or John 14, verse number 16. He says, I'm going to give you another comforter. There are two words in Greek for another. One is heteros, heterosexual, someone different. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to give you another comforter. Heteros, someone different than I am. Mm -mm. I'm going to give you another comforter. The word is alos, the same essence, the same usia, the same substance. The only difference is I can be with you. He's going to be in you. He's just like me, and I'm like my father, so that all three, one God makes his abode with us. Now, I don't expect you to understand, because God is mysterious. And when we get, get to uh, the point where we think that we are, act, we are actually uh, waxing eloquent about God, as uh, Martin Luther would say, uh, it's lisping. That's what we're doing. It's baby talk because nobody can talk without stuttering about God. You, you, you start fumbling over your words because he's too great and too lofty to talk in a refined way about him. Even angels have an economy of language. They don't tell God how immutable he is. He's a God of aseity. He's a God of immutability. He is a ubiquitous God. They just bow their heads and put their wings over their heads and they say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The old earth is full of his glory. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You anoint, oh, kings were anointed, and prophets were anointed, and priests were anointed, and David was anointed in 1 Samuel 16. He's anointed before the job is even available. Anointed. And so the Spirit anoints us, and even Jesus says in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, the Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me. And you see that graphic figure of Aaron in Psalm 133, where the oil runs down his head, down his beard, down his uh, robes. It's a picture of empowerment. The Spirit anoints our cup run over, our cup runs over. It's that great word in Ephesians 5.22, that 5.18, where Paul says, keep on being filled with the Spirit. That's the tense there. Keep on being filled. 
so that you can't even contain all that God gives. Sure, the goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To know the Holy Spirit is to know his benefits, to know his workings, and to know his appropriating. Hear the words of Jonathan Edwards, perhaps the greatest Protestant theologian ever to emerge from American soil, who said that God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a sweet and holy society, an eternal fellowship of mutuality and reciprocity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that you and I cannot trichotomize Trinity. We cannot try, try theosize Trinity. We can't even modalize Trinity. We can't say, well, God is God in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, he's Son, and today he's Spirit. No, he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at all times. And God never does anything without doing it inside of his triune self. Hear the words of John Newton, former slave owner and slave driver. He says, since there is no jealousy in the triune God, it is impossible to overpraise the Son or dishonor the Father or Spirit in the adoration of Christ. There is no such thing as Trinitarian turf wars. Hear Jesus being spoken of in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but emptied himself, condescended, took on the form of a man, was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. But from humiliation, from exaltation to humiliation, Back to exaltation. God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow things in heaven, things on earth, and things underneath the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I tell you, when you look in the 23rd Psalm, God is fully present as triune God, and we need not neglect him as the Holy Spirit moves upon our life. We've just got finished celebrating the 500th year of the Protestant Reformation. It's 95 Theses, October the 31st, 1517. Five solas we've basically canonized and made them sacrosanct, that is holy, based upon uh, what was believed and taught uh, by the Protestant reformers. Ad fontes, back to the sources, back to first century Christianity. Solo Christo, solo Christo, by Christ alone. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There's only one mediator between God and humans, the man Christ Jesus. No room for pluralism, no room for options, only Christ. Sola fide, by faith alone. Romans 5 and 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sola gratia. By grace alone, Ephesians 2 and 8. By grace are ye saved through faith. Sola, scriptura, by scripture alone, Matthew 4 and 4. Man shall not, human shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. All of this for soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. That's five. That's a quintet of solos. We need a sextet of solos. I know we believe in it. The reformers did. I think we ought to put another one there and call it what it is. Solu spiritu. By spirit alone. Here yeah, Paul say, Romans 8 and 9, the one who does not have the spirit of Christ is none of his. And in this song, God is reminding us that he never does anything outside of his triune self and for us to preach and the spirit is seldom if ever mentioned. Uh, we are in essence leaving off the triunity of the trinity of God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, 
Early in the morning our songs shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. The Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. The psalm opens up with Yahweh. The Lord. The Lord. Mm. Is. Mm. Uh, he always is. Because he never was and he never will be. He is. He's the eternal now. It's what the Lord said to Moses when Moses asked him, who are you? Who am I to tell Pharaoh uh, that you are? Because that's going to be Pharaoh's question in Exodus 5 and 2. Who is the Lord that I should let the people go? Mm. And God says, I am that I am. Which means God is saying to them, I am that I was. I am that I is. Bad grammar, great theology. I am that I will be. I am the eternal now. It's Richard Lisher in his book, The End of Words, who says that when God says in Exodus 3, 14, I am that I am, he is using a verb and a noun, but no adjective. And an adjective is supposed to describe and modify a noun, but there's no adjective there. I am that I am. And Lisher supports that and says, when you have a good noun, you don't need an adjective. I mean, what, what adjective is going to describe God? Well, he's good. Kentucky Fried Chicken is finger-licking good. I don't care what kind of language you have, he's better than that. Here's Evie Hill. Reading, he, decided, he said, I heard him say this. He said he got on the plane and he decided he didn't want to be bothered. He was tired. He didn't want anybody talking to him, so he did what you need to do when you don't want anyone to talk to you on the plane who's sitting next to you. He took out his Bible started reading. Nobody would talk to him. He started reading the 23rd Psalm. He was flying from the East Coast all the way back to L.A. The Lord. He was still on the Lord for about two hours. The Lord. Just thinking about the Lord. And then he got on is. He got stuck in the isness of God. The Lord is. Before he could get beyond is, he was landing. Because he couldn't get beyond is. When you think about who the Lord is in your life, mm, then you get stuck there. It's called contemplative theology. You're thinking about God to the point that your thoughts travel in the innermost recesses of your being and you get stuck. The Lord is my. Throughout the Psalter, the 105th Psalms, when the shepherd metaphor is tied to deity, that is, when the shepherd metaphor is tied to God, the relationship in most cases is between the shepherd and the community. The Lord is our shepherd. That's what you're going to see in most cases in the Psalm. This is the only place where the shepherd metaphor being tied to deity or to God shows a relationship between the shepherd, God, and the individual, me. The Lord is my shepherd. It's sanctified selfishness. You and I have got to get to the place where you start testifying. The Lord is mine, not, not by ownership, but by fellowship, association. The Lord is my shepherd. You've got to get to the place where you start talking about the Lord in terms of you and the Lord, nobody else. Sister Betty Johnson, the great mother from the New Mission Baptist Church who lives now in the precincts of heaven, used to say you've got to know that you know that you know that you know that you know. You've got to know for yourself. It can't be secondhand religion, something that you borrowed from someone else, something that you heard somebody else say. You've got to know it for yourself. You've got to be like Job in Job 19, 25 and through 27. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the latter day he shall stand upon the earth, and after the skin worms have devoured my body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes will not behold another. You've got to have a sense of mindness in relationship to the shepherd. Oh, like the blind man in John 9, 25. He had never seen the lily in his purple purity. He had never seen the rose in his crimson splendor. He had never seen his parents. He had never seen anything. 
But Jesus saw him one day and set up a pharmaceutical practice on the side of the road, spit in some dirt and put it on the man's eyes and sent him to sit because Siloam means sit. So he sent him to sit and he went and washed his eyes and he came back seeing. And the classical church bosses began to ask him, how did you get your sight back? And uh, he said, well, a man by the name of Jesus spit in some dirt and put it on my eyes, told me to go wash in Siloam, and now here I am, I'm seeing. And they immediately said, he's a sinner. And the man said, well, I, I, I don't have uh, any experience educationally, theologically, and Christology. I didn't go to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I don't know anything about Christology, but I can tell you this. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But I can tell you this. Whereas I was blind, now I see. You've got to get to the point, brothers and sisters, that you can testify, though you can't explain it, and say the Lord did it. In fact, you've got to have some experiences in your life that you cannot explain. Nothing will take and uh, give it a logical connection why you were spared, why you were able to get to school, why you were healed. All you can say is, God did it. You hear Paul saying in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I believe. And I know that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The Lord is my shepherd. We love that statement. We don't contend with it. We don't struggle with it at all because we want him to be our shepherd, to provide for us. We want him to be our Jehovah Jireh. Our struggle is when there is a redemptive reversal, like going from first to last to, as Dr. Kelly told us, last to first. It's not the struggle of the Lord being our shepherd. It's the struggle of the shepherd being our Lord. We want him to be our shepherd. But when the shepherd becomes our Lord, which means he orders not only my steps, but he orders my stops, then we struggle with that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have everything that I need. One little girl was looking at this and she recited it. It was her time to recite it in church like we used to do. We call them pieces uh, in Sunday school when we'd have uh, Christmas and Easter, etc. She said, the Lord is my shepherd. What more do I want? That's not how the psalm is to be recited, but I declare it's great theology. The Lord is my shepherd. What more do I want? What else do you want? If the Lord is your shepherd, he's got everything that you need. In fact, he supplies our needs and has the supply available before we're even aware of the need. We will quote Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply, there's another my, my God shall supply all our needs according to his riches in heaven through Christ Jesus our Lord. He's talking about spiritual blessings, right, in the context, spiritual. Mm. But he also supplies physical and material blessings. Do you not hear him say in Matthew 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And he does this before we're even aware of it. One of our secretaries of years ago, years ago, her name is Cheryl Hallquist, who now serves at the Colonial Baptist Church uh, in Cary, uh, North Carolina, along with her husband, uh, Dr. Gary Hallquist, who used to serve down here at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary in the music ministry. She came up with a term that's not in the dictionary, but I love it, the previosity of God, that God is previous. He goes before us and he's working things out before we are aware of it. It is biblical. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 65 and 24. Before you call, I'll answer. What? <laughs> and while you're praying, I will hear. What? The black preacher used to say, God is so quick that he is before right now. And he is before at once. In fact, God goes before us so that we have nothing that we need that he does not supply. Now, I, I know I'm not going to finish this tonight. I understand that. May not do it tomorrow. I don't know what the Lord has. 
I just learned after 51 and a half years to ride it as long as he'll let me ride it and to get off and let the spirit not only make implication, but take and uh, impart the word that he wants each one of us to hear. He makes me to lie down, lie down in green pastures. Sheep cannot eat when there are uh, predators around. Green pastures, green grass where sheep can graze. David did it all the time with his father's sheep. His father's name was Jesse. And the Lord does it with us. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the cool waters flow, bathes the weary one's feet. God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood, some through great trials. But God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, still waters are not stagnant waters. Uh, sheep can't drink from rapidly flowing streams. In fact, if the stream is rapidly flowing and they take and bend over and start trying to sip the water, they might fall into the stream and because of the water going through their wet wool, they're, they're not able to pull themselves out of the stream and they might drown. And so the shepherd will take a fast flowing stream of water and take large boulders and rocks and dam up the stream so that the waters are still and sheep can sip water because that's what God does for us. He dams up that which is too fast flowing. In fact, some of us are sitting here right now and we are tired, tired in church work, tired in the busyness of life, tired with the situation in the world. Some are just tired, and they're tired is tired. They're tired. And God is able to dam up the stream, slow it down to the point that he lets us sit and be refreshed so the waters are still but not stagnant. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. What a word. Sheep sometimes would fall off of their uh, toothpick-like legs, all that weight, and these legs that don't seem to support the body, almost as if God made some kind of zoological mistake in terms of the anatomy, and fall over on their back. And the gases could build up to the point that they could suffocate and give themselves to asphyxiation. And they couldn't pick themselves up. And the shepherd, a good shepherd, would have to, and David did at times, I'm sure, stand the sheep back on his feet so it could survive. Could this be what David is talking about in Psalm 51, 10 through 12? Cast me not away from your presence. Take your Holy Spirit uh, from me. Restore, there it is unto me, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Stand me back up on my feet. He was successful in killing the giant Goliath, but he was defeated by the giant adultery. He needed to be put back up on his feet. And brothers and sisters, maybe you're the only one here. You've never fallen off of your feet. You've always been steady. You've always been steadfast. You've never made a mistake. You never made a wrong decision. And God, with some of us, has had to put us back up on our feet. Restore our ministry. Restore our marriage. Restore our family. Restore our health. Stop counting people out. God is a God who restores. He will take a Peter who says, I don't know Jesus, and won't take him off of the preaching calendar knowing that he's going to fall, said to him in Luke 22, 31 to 34, Simon, Simon, Satan had desired to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you that you would not fail, not fall, you're going to fall, but that your faith would not fail. And after you have turned back, strengthen your brother. 
knowing that he was going to take and fall, he kept him on the preaching calendar. Had it been me, someone's going to deny me, and then I've got him on the calendar to preach on the day of Pentecost, you're coming off, brother, not with Jesus. He knows exactly what we're going to do. He knows we're going to fail. And grace just keeps our name on the calendar even when we don't deserve it. He takes and restores us and puts us back on our feet. Maybe I can get through just two more things. Nine o'clock is when we're supposed to greet and meet. So that means what I don't finish here, I think the Lord is saying to me, finish it up tomorrow. So all right. Thank you, Lord. I hear what you're saying. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Mm. Across, crisscrossed, actually, across hillsides in Jerusalem and other places, there are, and the, the, the Hebrew word here is wagon tracks of righteousness, grooves, paths that have been traveled until uh, there is a groove in them, wagon tracks of righteousness. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, and it is up to the shepherd to know the path so well that selecting the right paths leads to provision and leads away from predators. And it could be disastrous to go on a path and there are predators waiting there or there is no food for them to graze on. He leads me in the paths, the paths of righteousness because the shepherd knows the path. It is not important ultimately for us to know the path. It is important for him to know it. Sometimes you're going to have to travel with a sense of a holy hunch, just a hunch. You can't find any scripture. Mm -mm. You know the Bible supports it, but you can't find a book, a chapter, a verse that will point you to what you ought to do. You just have a holy hunch because you've been in touch with the Lord and you know his voice and you just got a feeling, a feeling. That's all you have. It's just a feeling. And that feeling is being guided by the Spirit's and he knows the way that you take. That's what Job is saying in Job 23 and 10. For he knows the way I take. And after he's tried me, I'll come forth as go. You may not know the way, but since he is the way, he knows the way. And when you have to walk in a place where there is low or no visibility, we walk by faith and we don't walk by sight. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Why? This is, this is my closing box. I, I can't get to four, five, and six. For his name sake, for his glory. The reputation of a shepherd was staked upon one thing. If you have a hundred sheep, do you bring back a hundred? If you have a hundred sheep and you lose sheep, then it diminishes and reduces your reputation as a shepherd. That's why Jesus would say in John 6, 39, the ones whom the Father has given to me, I've lost none. That's why Jesus would say in John 10, 28, those whom the Father has given me, no one has been able to snatch them out of my hand. That's why Jesus would tell the parable of the shepherd and a hundred sheep in Luke 15, 1 to 4. One is lost. He leaves, leaves the 90 and 9. Now, for many years, I read that, and I thought he left the 99 safely in the barn, safely in the power. I say he left them on the mountains where there were mountain lions, coyotes, and all kinds of animals, which meant that this was a possible economic liability. You leave nine to find one, but he left 99 found the one, and the one had to be injured. And don't let artists give you a misconception. He puts the one sheep back on his shoulder. I've always read that as lamb, because every time I saw this artistic drawing, it was the shepherd holding a lamb. This is not a lamb. It's a sheep, a 100-pound sheep. He must have valued that sheep. Carrying a 100-pound sheep in that arid condition Carried a hundred pound sheep that was maimed and injured. Carried that one hundred pound sheep over across terrain where there were dips and crevices and all of that. He loved that sheep. And when I think about how much he loved me, 
He has carried me all the way. No wonder, no wonder David, no wonder David would talk about as he faced the giant Goliath. You come to me, he says. But I want to tell you, when a lion came to attack my father's sheep, I killed the lion. When a bear came to attack my father's bear, I killed the bear. Because my reputation and his renown, Jesse's renown, was based upon my ability to bring back the ones that he had given me. I'm glad tonight that God continues to carry us and carry us, or oh, we'll see tomorrow, not only through green pastures, but beside still waters. And he knows the path so much so that he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How shall I say thanks for the things he has done for me, things so undeserved, and yet he did to prove his love for me? The voices of the many angels cannot express my gratitude. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me. With his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Don't neglect God the Spirit in his work in your life and ministry.